care about current affairs, it's on the old show. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on the old show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself into the old show, it's the old show. Laura Babcock. Welcome the to the old show, Canada's current affairs show with strong opinions. I'm your host, Laura Babcock. And I've got some opinions, as does my guest, and they're going to be strong because I think I can speak for both of us. We are more than fed up, fed up with Andrea Horvath, who was the leader of the official opposition who decided instead of targeting Doug Ford in the last election, she was going to turn her guns on the liberals for some reason. And of course, we all know what happened. Ford strolled in with another majority, even though he only had about 18 percent of the vote. So Andrea Horvath then quits decides that she wants to run for mayor of Hamilton because, you know, a job that would have been waiting for her based on all her years as a Hamilton counselor and as a Hamilton fighter at Queen's Park. And what has she done with it since? Almost nothing. My guest today, Graham Crawford, has long been an observer of Hamilton City Hall. I wanted to sort of tie in the provincial to the local because I know whenever I post about Andrea Horvath, I hear from a lot of people across the province who are very, very frustrated with how she handled the last election uh, and are paying close attention to how she is failing as mayor of Hamilton. That's my perspective. What's yours? Oh, indeed, I agree. I think she has failed us uh, as our mayor. I mean, it's all, Laura, you've talked about her uh, running in the last provincial election as the leader of the, the Ontario New Democratic Party. Uh, you know, I thought about this. It's almost like Andrea used to be a big star when she was in that position. And then she was forced to come home and earn a living at doing dinner theater in Hamilton. You know, it's uh, she, she has failed us terribly at every, every turn. There are no new ideas. Uh, the only strong leadership that I've seen is once. And that was when she used her strong mayor powers, the powers that Doug Ford gave her, to make a decision about a couple of parking lots in Stony Creek. Other than that, it's photo op after photo op. Uh, if you watch council meetings like I do, uh, it's another trip to the word salad bar for, for Andrea because she just, she talks, she says maybe 50 words, and uh, says nothing. I mean, she just, I watch her style of thinking and talking and she's making it up as she goes. She's not prepared. She has no clear positions on things. So she has to make it up in the moment and she's not good at it. She got away with it before because she was in opposition. She's the leader now. But I, I, I have to say, um, I don't think leadership is her first language. I mean, she just is not doing the job. We look to other counselors who, who do that. And this most recent thing that she did about the sanctioned, uh, she wanted to use her strong mayor powers to get staff to uh, put some details together on sanctioned uh, encampment sites. This was already happening. Joey Coleman uh, pointed this out. Uh, there was already a unanimous motion uh, passed by council. Staff was to uh, prepare and present their report in August. Andrea swings in before the report is tabled and says, uh, hey, I'd like one for September. And if you look at the difference between the two, there's precious little. It's not like she reinvented the motion or took a great leap forward and has used her strong mayor powers to make this big change. She hasn't, but she's calling it. She's spinning it. Uh, as strong mayor powers, decisiveness, in other words. Uh, it's, yeah, I've said it before on this show, <laughs> and it is uh, social media, so it's bullshit. You know, she's not doing it. I watch it. I watch her all the time. She's terrible. And so it's so frustrating for me about that. And I know uh, you had supported her candidacy when she was in the NDP, uh, and you supported her yep. in the campaign. And then when she quit, after uh, Ford won another majority. I had her here on the O Show. It was a conversation that didn't go well for her because she had nothing but platitudes, no plan, no new ideas. And I didn't even think an articulation of the ideas she was supposed to be putting forward in her platform. Uh, it felt very much like she was just gonna phone it in. And at a time when our 
province and our cities need such leadership to get through these giant crises coming out of the pandemic, uh, I felt that she would fail as mayor because she just didn't have what it would take. You know, we don't need a, a baby kissing mayor. We need a mayor who actually does the work and has the solutions. Uh, and she's so not right, Laura, but she's using a rotary dial phone to do it. I mean, it's it's just so old fashioned. So when you say earlier that leadership is not her first language, I don't think she's a leader at all. I think that yeah. leadership means you have people following you because you're taking them somewhere. When she has a million dollars in staff, uh, although she doesn't actually have all of her staff even now, and she has turnover. So uh, there are empty positions. There's turnover uh, that, that speaks to leadership as well. Uh, she did not hit the ground running like she said she would. Uh, I, I so remember her appearance on the O Show and you pushing her for facts and figures and actions and ideas. And, and she deflected and said, oh, no, that, that, that will come when I speak to the people. Well, she's had two years to do that. And we have nothing. It's not like we have a bad plan. We have no plan. Any details have come from council. And I Not got so mad, off. Graham, I got so mad. I couldn't even, you know, usually I'm pretty quick to respond, especially on Twitter. It's kind of my, you know, my where I like to play. I couldn't respond to her little declaration of asking staff to look into sanction encampment issue. Um, not just because it was bullshit, because it was nothing new and it was nothing substantive and it would seem like just another stall and another poor attempt at spin, but because the language in it actually said, in, you know, speaking in her voice, I have walked through communities, I have spoken with our most vulnerable. Bullshit. I mean, maybe... Yeah maybe recently in some kind of controlled situation to be able to defend that spin. But I can tell you that when 70 people experiencing homelessness, many of whom were very sick, camped in front of City Hall in the cold earlier this year, I would go down and visit them and they would consistently beg the mayor just to come out, walk the 20 meters to come and talk to them. But that was beneath her. She wouldn't do it. They wouldn't let them have the bathrooms. They treated them like absolute crap. And so the idea that she's been walking around and chit-chatting and meeting with people, I think that's, they, I was so angry that I couldn't respond for days. I, I well, just, not only did she not go out to the front of City Hall when that encampment was there, she didn't go out to the back of City Hall when the encampment was beside Whitehurst. Okay. And what did we do with that encampment? We moved it. We didn't find them housing. We didn't find them shelter. We just got city staff, garbage trucks, the police, and we destroyed it and, and moved them on their way. Andrea, uh, I mean, I, I said, Laura, oh God, a year and a half ago, she's fake. She's a fake mayor. It got even worse than I thought it would get. I thought she might find her, 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 her you know, feet and then start to understand she's going to need to lead by giving details and so on. Uh, she's no better now than the day she uh, walked into that office. Uh, we're no better off since the day she walked into that office. And in fact, I think if anything, in the face of a crisis, we have no evidence of crisis management. Crisis management is different than management. You have to do things differently. It's not same old, same old. Our city staff is not set up for crisis management but we're using them as crisis managers, but they don't have the capability in my experience uh, or, or, or opinion. Um, and I'm not criticizing. Crisis management is a specialty. So if we don't have them, then hire somebody who is good at this stuff. Um, we have resources, we have great staff. We have a lot of great staff, but you have to marshal those resources in a, in a crisis environment and we're not doing it. Um, and you know, and Graham, as, as a, are complaining because because they're not seeing progress. So the issues around the drug poisoning crisis and homelessness are complex. Uh, yeah. We have right now uh, two hundred thirty-four thousand people living in homelessness throughout Ontario. The average 
age of death for a woman in homelessness is 44 years old. If we can just take a moment to reflect on our neighbors and our family members who might be women and imagine losing them at 44 because of not enough food and shelter in one of the richest countries on earth. It's, it's obnoxious and obscene. Uh, so it is a, it's a tough problem. And your point about crisis management is well taken. I don't do crisis management of the problem, but I do do crisis management of the communication of problems. And oftentimes there is some crisis management mixed in with that. And in my experience working on crisis, some of them quite large, not this big, but quite large for clients, is that it's like a daily, all hands on deck, strategy meeting, war rooms in the morning, how are we going to message it? What's coming at us? What does that look like? How do we align our, our values uh, to address it, keep people informed? What are our guardrails? I mean, it is a it is a specialty and it is challenging, but when it is done well, it can make a huge difference. And even if the crisis itself is a multi-year, multi-pronged super challenge, like the homelessness crisis has become, the communication of the crisis is something that she could be doing now and so much better. She could have been telling us all along from the get, this is a major priority. We are going to do you know, something like Los Angeles mayor. These are all the areas we're going to explore. These are all the things we're going to do. Sure, staff has a homelessness plan now, but who's supposed to articulate that? Who's supposed to share the vision and give the hope and be accountable to the metrics and the progress? Who should be out there in a crisis communicating, if not daily about it through her platforms, weekly about it? She only communicates about the homelessness crisis when there's a hue and cry, a cacophony so loud, Graham, whether it's our shows or our op-eds or the business community coming forward. That's when we hear from this Mayor Andrea Horvath, only in a reaction space, not in a crisis management space, just from a comms perspective. And I got to say, I don't know if you've seen the numbers, Graham, the amount of money they spent on those billboards to demonize the issue, to put a negative cast on it, to have those stupid community meetings where they did, you know, green or red flags on the on the humanity of your neighbors. All of that garbage was on her watch, was it not? How much was spent on that campaign as opposed to actually helping and setting up an emergency shelter? Did you ever hear the figures from that? Because from a comms perspective, that wasn't cheap. No, it wasn't cheap. Uh, she also wasn't part of that, really. I mean, she was a spectator. Uh, but this you know, Roman forum, thumbs up, thumbs down process that they used, um, you know, for, for people there with, with pitchforks and torches. I mean, it's, it was appalling. Um, let, me, let me just point something out that happened quite recently at a council meeting. Um, your councillor, Tom Jackson, who is now in his, I believe, 35th year, and I don't think I'm overstating that, Tom has said this twice now. He said it once on the radio on CHML, uh, obviously literally a few days before it went dark. Yeah. But he said it uh, at council as well. He said, I, you know, Tom loves to speechify. Hmm. He wants to let people know ahead of time something's going to fail, but he tends to pick stuff that's really difficult so that he would have been right, as opposed to saying, I, I know it's going to be really tough. I've got a few ideas. May I share them? That's not what Tom does. Tom says, this isn't going to work. It's horrible. But here's what he said. The mayor puts out her strong mayor powers motion. They're going to get staff to identify uh, sanctioned encampment sites. And they're going to make some decisions about costs and so on. And the costs are running Estimated costs are running anywhere from $15 million to $33 million at the moment. That'll only go up, of course. It also depends on how many sites. But Tom says, I may, I may vote to, to su support the money for these sanctioned encampments. But I have two conditions. There will not be one in Ward 6. And the encampment protocol that has to remain, it's not like everybody's going to internment camps, which is what Tom would like. Um, we, I, I don't want any more encampments uh, in Ward 6. Not just this park. He wants his ward to be clean of these things. Uh, 35 years and the mayor doesn't call him out. 
Uh, the rest of council should have called him out. Like, who the hell do you think you are, Tom? You haven't had a fucking idea uh, since since your your coffee shops went bankrupt before you became a, a councillor. Um, like, how dare you say that? We don't want these filthy beings in my ward. And as long as they're not here, I don't give a shit where they are. Um, that is not leadership either. But not only that, it sh the statement shouldn't even have been allowed. It most certainly shouldn't have gone unchallenged by a real strong mayor. And she doesn't need Doug Ford's strong mayor powers to push back on that kind of shocking commentary by the Ward 6 Councillor Tom Jackson. So let me just clarify a couple of things for the sake of accuracy here on the O Show. I don't think he's ever called them filthy beings, right? You're just characterizing. I, I, but, but when you say, I don't want them here, right. why? Yeah, I just don't want to put words in his mouth. His words are bad enough and, and they're damning enough on their own. Uh, also, when you say he wants internment camps, why do you say that? Where does that come from? Well, look, if, if, if you believe that a sanctioned encampment, which is basically a fenced, it'll, it'll, if it isn't literally fenced, it'll be you know uh, essentially fenced camp. And then you, because we have counselors who are saying we won't need the encampment protocol if we have these uh, sites, which means what? What conclusions you draw from that? They have to go to the, these encampment sites. They have to be put in these camps. I'm calling them camps, but what else would you call them? Uh, whether they're, you know, even if they're small uh, huts, they're, we've done this before in this country. We've moved people, more than one culture, into sites. Um, because if you believe that, that you have to go to the sites, then of course you conclude no more tents in parks because they're not allowed. The police will drag them into a camp. And what staff, professional staff are saying is, no, that's not what's gonna happen. We wanna create enough spaces in these sanctioned sites so that we have the majority, ideally all of those who are in encampments right now moving to these uh, sanctioned sites. But they know that's not gonna happen. There will be people who don't wanna go. So what do you do? Do you arrest them? Can't do that. It's not allowed. But so you have to question Tom's logic and thought process. And he's not alone in this, by the way. There are other counselors who are saying essentially the same thing. Now, they're not putting out edicts saying, I will only support the, the, the increased budget for these encampments, these sanction sites, if you don't have any in my ward and there's no camping in parks or in my ward at all, anywhere. You, know, you got to think that through and say, well, so what's the conclusion then, Tom? Oh, I follow your logic. I know I follow it. I just want to make sure they were accurate versus characterizations of their thinking and their words and their actual <laughs> thinking and words. Uh, but his actual thinking and words are damning enough to me. When I saw that, I was livid. And I was livid yeah. because uh, I live in that ward. I have not voted for him in a long time. And he knows it for this reason and others. Uh, and his, we have one of the, so I'm across from a city housing project, right? Um, there is now a young man who is living in homelessness at our Tim Hortons that I see every time I drive out of there. Uh, and the idea that we're going to ban people in Ward 6 from being part of these encampments that are sanctioned when I also live a couple of blocks away from one of the largest parks in all of Hamilton, which is almost always empty completely empty. The idea we can't fit an encampment that's sanctioned in that park is insane. But moreover, the idea to me in total of sanctioned encampments is also kind of crazy. What we need is transitional housing, deeply supportive transitional housing and programs to help people successfully transition into housing. So encampments whether in sanctioned or not, and I agree with you, they're still going to exist because when I speak to people who are being moved out of the encampment at City Hall, they said, well, if they move us somewhere far away, uh, I can't 
but you know, panhandle to feed myself and my family. So, I mean, they're always going to be in urban centers until there is the treatment programs to deal with any crisis they're dealing with personally and the access to deeply affordable housing and supports that they need. I have to mention, I, I believe the only reason we are actually pursuing this sanctioned sites discussion, I mean, who knows if it's actually going to happen, um, is because po it's a political move because essentially what's what certain residents are saying is i don't like seeing these people around and of course they 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 go on about you know uh drugs and their children aren't safe and so on and i'm not dismissing stuff you know but uh you know we have to look after kids uh, you know whether there's a tent nearby or not um so what they want to do is they want them to disappear and the best way the easiest way for them to disappear is to stick them in a camp the hardest way for them to, quote, disappear is to build housing for them, to build shelter, like real shelters. But even that's a temporary measure, as we know, but we don't, we're not even doing that. Like, imagine if we had hit the ground running two years ago and said, we're going to build something or we're going to buy a building. There have been lots of apartment buildings that have sold in the last two years. We didn't buy any of them. Why? Because we didn't have a plan because we thought it might go away, because we might, we thought maybe we could beat Doug Ford into submission and he'd throw, you know, a couple hundred million dollars our way. Didn't happen. So she, she tweets literally the day we're taping this from Ottawa um, at the, uh, the Ontario uh, Association of Municipalities of Ontario. <laughs> I think I've got it, it's close. Looking forward to meeting with the Minister of Housing, the Minister, it's like, so here's the, here's the scenario. You go to a conference with hundreds and hundreds of people all competing for the same thing. And that's when you decide you're going to make your case for funding. It's like, are you out of your mind? You shouldn't even be dealing with a minister, any ministers. You should be tapped into the to the premier's office and you, like we've said on this show laura why don't you go down there with a busload of counselors i don't give a shit if it's theater if it's media theater but do something that says oh all roads lead to doug ford we're doing our best and hamiltonians should be they may be pissed off but they should be proud of the money they're putting in to try to do something at least Andrea is letting us down. She's the weak link between us and Queen's Park. And for that matter, the feds. The feds keep coming to Hamilton, giving us the same $93 million. Photo op after photo op after photo op. It's the only thing that keeps Chad Collins awake. He has to go to these photo ops because it's the same $93 million. It's the same 47 units of housing at Cannon and Bay. We keep announcing the same damn housing. And we fall for it. I'm not kidding. This is what, and it gets reported on, so they keep doing it. If the feds, if the feds gave us $93 million every time they claim to have come to give us money for housing, we 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 probably have 500, 600, 700 million dollars by now. But we don't. We have $93 million. It's almost so, as though she's so she's it's all like I don't know. You tell me, but <laughs> She can't, she does photo ops with these guys, whether it's Trudeau, Ford. And I feel cringe because on the one hand, I know, yes, that's the game. You got to do these photo ops, but there's never the follow-up press conference like we see Olivia Chow doing where it's like pushing for the urgency and, and setting the table and demanding. I mean, to your point about her thing at the AMO conference in Ottawa, just a pic of her and a bunch of other staffers running across the street going, we're going to remind them of the needs of Hamilton. They don't need reminding. They absolutely Zero. know. They Zero need value. pressure. They need pressure to do something. And as a mayor, you have the power. Forget the strong mayor powers. You just have the power of the bully pulpit and the media. And now we are, of course, losing media. We lost CHML in the last couple of days, which I'd love your thoughts on in a minute. Um, but the fact is, you have the power. You have a large X Twitter feed. You have social media. You have CH television. You have the podcast environment in Hamilton. There are lots of ways you can go up front of City Hall with a freaking microphone and people will listen. 
but you have to care enough to communicate with urgency and compassion and redundancy. You have to understand that in 2024, you have to say less and say it more frequently to break through the noise. She should know this. We should know her plan on homelessness. There should be a label for it and it should be something that we can all track. We have seen nothing from her, but busy photo ops pretending she's doing the job of mayor. You nailed it when you said she's a fake. It's sickening to me because fake that I have to pay for sucks. Fake that's making our city worse and people I care for are living in absolute squalor and medical conditions that look like it's freaking war. It looks like a war zone when you see people with amputations with duct tape on their legs, with open wounds, with things that should be treated in a hospital, living downtown on the streets of Hamilton amongst our vaulted buildings at James and Maine. I mean, what kind of a mayor, Graham, can live with her city being like that? Does she ever drive downtown? Does she ever think to herself, this is on me to do everything I can do? Instead, she threw parties for the New Year's levy while the mayor of Halifax gave the money to homelessness for his parties. She doesn't care. She's shown no evidence of that. And I don't care about her stupid little declaration pictures she posts, taking credit for things council's already doing. People are dying in our community almost daily because of neglect from our leaders. Every level of government has some kind of uh, ownership of this. I agree completely. And it is absolutely fair to say the feds and the province needs to, to do much, much more than they have done. Mm -hmm. But so what? Sam Marula said that for 15 years and, and he hasn't been a counselor for the last two years. He's gone. Mm. So we don't need to keep hearing that. And that was through many different kinds of governments. It wasn't all Doug Ford, but he always used to say that. Downloading, you know, it's so, okay. So it's a fact of life, but there is no creative pushback um, by Andrea, by the mayor, by her staff, by, by the, well, even the rest of council, although God knows some of them are, are trying, but she tries to jump in front of them when they try to do stuff. Because Tammy Wang put forward that motion about having a staff report on sanctioned sites. And then she jumped the queue and went in front of Tammy before the report hit council, the council floor. That's what actually happened. And if Andrea wants to spin it as, oh, it's a completely different motion, read them. Look at them. I did. There's not, a, there's not a, it's nonsense. So look, she is not going to reinvent herself. Now, I said that before. And I'm absolutely sure of it now. She came into this office at, with uh, 27 years experience, uh, earning her living speaking in public. <gasps> right. Like, like seriously, all you need to do is watch a council meeting and see her speak in public. And you think that's it? That's the quality that we got for 27 years of honing your expertise. It's shocking, actually. It's really shocking. Uh, but she's been getting away with it. She's been skating apparently through, she's now 61 years old. Do you think she's going to reinvent herself now? She's not. So this is it. We're, we're stuck. Um, if something good happens, it will be, be in spite of her. It will be because of council getting together and doing the right thing. Although I, I get, become increasingly more worried about uh, the divisions on councils, particularly as it relates to homelessness. Um, it's, you know, get them out of here. I don't want to see them. My constituents are telling me they don't want to see tents. So therefore, the solution is, why aren't the police doing more? Why aren't we using law enforcement to get them out of here? That's what councillors around the table are, some of them. And thankfully, I think there's a bare majority who are saying, uh-uh, we're not doing that. This is a problem we've got to try to remedy somehow. We're, it's not going to be easy. When um, I'll, I'll let you finish your point, but when Councillor JP Danko tweeted out, and I know he tweets out a lot of stuff to be provocative or whatever, the game he's playing down the lips, but when he tweeted out that, you know, he just done a radio show on CHML about how are they getting these tents anyway? Like I almost fell off of whatever chair I was sitting on. I'm like, that's the issue? How are these people with nothing managing to get these tents? Let's investigate, <laughs> you know, shut up.
go and help people. Like, this is where I'm getting to the point with some of these counselors who seem to be caught in this rut of this argument now. It's not a good look. Get out of yep. the rut. Get back yep. on the road to solutions, please, because you're hurting people with your words, let alone your inaction. Well, you're also insulting uh, John Paul Danko, who I like to refer to as the beer can counselor, because he, every time he posts, he's got, you know, he's holding a can of beer. Right. Uh, why? Why? How? Do, because he like he thinks he's being clever by being provocative, and of course he gets a reaction because his stuff is so outrageously bad and inhumane. Oh, and he famously said the people in homelessness uh, couldn't have access to alcohol or drugs. So yeah, whatever. Uh, but I'm enjoying my beer, you know, right. which he's done many times uh, from his sailboat, you know, from his cottage, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, uh, you know, I mean, I you're, you could have those things. I, I'm, you know, I have, like good. I'm, I'm OK with with acquiring assets, but but don't lose your humanity in the process. He, he's and don't, and by, don't lose your power to harm. That's the distinctor. I, the distinctor that's great, thing, right? great point. No, it's a great point. I mean, the power to harm, because that is precisely what he's doing by saying, where are they getting these tents? He's insulting those who care, and he's hurting those who need mm -hmm. with one tweet. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's the tweet reflects his attitude, and that's the problem. It's not just a throwaway tweet. It reveals who he is, and he should be ashamed of himself. I, I mean, seriously, though, I know that word gets thrown out there, but like, really, that is so bad. Um, uh, my mother, long ago, God rest her soul, was so kind. If she'd heard that kind of stuff from a counselor, I think even my mother would have started marching because, because she would have felt that he was hurting people and not caring and not showing compassion. No one has the solution for this. My counselor, Cameron Cratch, Ward 2, has said, we, we have a, in Hamilton, we have a billion dollar homelessness problem that we cannot solve ourselves. I think he said what on the O show, unless there's a B in front of it, uh, it's not a real solution, right? Or one of the counselors recently on the O show said that. So it's a billion it's dollar problem. Um, but you know, JP's tweets, and uh, like I said, I don't mind, JP works hard. I don't mind, he's got a sailboat and he does whatever with his weekends. But you can't tell other people that they can't have the same access to escape that you enjoy. and talking about where they're getting their tents as though they're somehow doing something wrong or people who are helping them are somehow doing something wrong. Uh, that felt to me a little like Ford laughing at people who are waiting for MRIs and telling them to go to a vet. I mean, it's that oh. callous indifference. It's that same sense of, I can use my power to help, but instead I'm going to laugh. I'm going to, you know, make them feel worse. I mean, that's what pisses me off. Don't use your power for harm. If you can't use it for good, like Andrea Horvath isn't using hers for good, she's not doing a damn thing. At least she's not coming out and saying, you know, mocking people in homelessness. Uh, that is a whole level of worse. And, and you know, and, and we needed to call JP out for that. Let me introduce something. It is connected, but it is it is separate. And that's this Hupig mm. project downtown so cops coliseum you know first ontario place um, or first ontario center whatever it's called cops coliseum um their private equity is being poured into that facility mm -hmm. to completely renovate the interior right there'll be some changes to the exterior but i heard the the, the person who is behind the uh, whatever it is 300 million dollars or something like that so we're not going to be changing the outside that much because it's a it's a well-known i think he actually said heritage building which of course is bullshit but nevertheless it's his way of saying we're not putting any money on the outside at least we'll buff it up a little bit that's what i heard. but we'll see so this get, gets spun at council and every time there's a chance for hupac to come in it's about the the downtown renaissance i mean we've had more downtown renaissances in the you know in the last 50 years i mean honest to god we should be as you know shining city on a hill and we're not um but let's not kid ourselves what's going to be different about this hupeg you know entertainment district renaissance 
they're gonna we're gonna have an arena oh but we already had one we're gonna have a concert hall oh we had one of those too we're gonna have a big art gallery well we've had that for years oh convention center oh we've had that too so they're going to redecorate mm -hmm. and this somehow is going to change downtown well why would it change it it's the same shit over and over again it's fine i, I don't hate any of those things but that is not a catalyst you know what a catalyst is is it is that group using their power to to move the salvation army that's what they're going to really push for and if they if they wanted to do that it's already in the media so i'm not making this up um and if the salvation army says sure if we can agree on a place that doesn't hurt our people and you build it for us and we move and you can take this space fine I, I don't think that's a bad idea as long as they're not moving them out to the airport uh, because, which of course is this whole encampment is sanctioned encampment mentality hide them somewhere yeah. but not i don't want to be able to see them that's that but this hupeg thing needs we need to call call it out for what it is um what is going to cause the renaissance downtown i said to somebody the other day if if we had if taylor swift came to our new coliseum every week what's what's going to change people will do like they've done before we saw like we've never had a decent act in right. in cops coliseum. so people come in like they do everywhere else they drive down the parking lots are full they go in have the concert they get back out in their car and they go home and some of them, but not many, go to restaurants before or after. But it's not like I say, I mean this, like if Taylor Swift came every week, what's the difference? Right. People come to a concert, they pay a lot more. They apparently were going to have much posher uh, boxes, uh, whatever those things are called, those uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> boxes that, uh, with the couches and you know $40 hot dogs and all that crap. Um, you know, and, and horrible cheese sauce <laughs> with Doritos so, for like $150 or some stupid, the corporate boxes. Anyway, but seriously though, we're, we're being, in my opinion, uh, we've got, there is a bunch of questions that need to be asked and answered at council. And by the way, Laura, I watched council this week. QPEC came and gave a pitch. They had their lawyer there who is quote representing them but is not actually a, a member of HUPEC. I think he's he's providing legal assistance and so on. Brad Clark asked a very serious question because this was supposed to be an update meeting. Yeah. And the lawyer said, I, I can't speak on behalf of the management. And Brad said, no well, where is the management? Because PJ Mercanti, as you know, has is, is been the, the face of this. He's not alone in this, but he is the, the face of HUPEC. He wasn't there. So what questions could council ask? They couldn't. They couldn't get any details. Is this so, a three-year secret deal? Yeah. Okay. We still don't know all the details uh, and nobody's talking about it. Hmm. Um, but Brad Clark, to his credit, he's clearly onto something. I don't know what it is because I don't speak to Brad Clark about this stuff. But he was at, he was starting to go down a road and the lawyer said, uh, you know, I, I can't. And so Clark said, well, then let's get them here next month. Mm -hmm. Want answers? Because there's stuff in the contract, apparently. This is what it, Clark seemed to be suggesting, that he wants some answers. On. And uh, so this, this spin is renaissance, renaissance. You won't believe it. It's all going to change. It's going to be like magic. It's like, yeah, I heard this from Vic Cops, you know, 100 years ago. And look Larry what happened. Danny always talked about the Hamilton downtown renaissance. And listen, if PJ and company, although I do not like a secret deal ever, um, but if PJ and company are going to invest in the entertainment zone, uh, make their money back and help the community in the process, help the Salvation Army have a better location that they support and pay for. In other words, if they were are going to help the community and not harm our most vulnerable by you know, having them sort of shoved out sight on, you know, out of sight, out of mind or anything else. I support people investing in a community, in a downtown, in things that give the, I support restaurants that are privately owned. 
I got no problem other than the secrecy of this deal, given that it's public assets. Um, but my problem is when I hear things about an entertainment district and a renaissance and a zone, I think, okay, but I've heard that before and I've supported it over the years many times. But what about the reality we started this show with? What about the business community going to the mayor and saying, you know what, or, or you know, the chamber saying, this has got to, this has got to give, something's got to change. What is the compassion tone in that? What is the, sol the solution by leaders in this community? You know, I've sat on all those leadership boards and cabals or whatever back in the day when the manufacturing left and we were looking for ways to save Hamilton. I've been in those conversations. I've run power conferences to discuss solutions. This is not a new narrative, but the crisis is worse than it's ever been. And the lack of compassion I'm hearing from council is alarming to me. The nothing but a veneer of caring and acting on this from the mayor is deeply alarming to me. A business community that is being brought to the brink, I used to run a chamber of commerce, that's deeply alarming to me. So what you need in an alarm is you need a crisis response and you need a leader of that crisis response. With a vacuum of leadership with Mayor Horvath, who's not doing what needs to be done, my concern, and I don't know if you share it, Graham, is that it might turn into a, we can only be prosperous if we get rid of these people. And these people are people that I've come to know and I am fiercely protective of. And I'm just worried that the citizens of Hamilton are going to be put into some kind of an, a, a culture war where it's like we can either have good things that are fun, uh, you know, or we can take care of the people who are homeless downtown, but we can't have both. So we're going to have to be OK with them being shipped out to these these sanctioned encampment camps. Uh, I mean, I'm deeply alarmed by where this could go if it's not managed with compassion and clarity and true leadership. That is where it's going. That is the narrative that's being spun here. We will put them in camps uh, and we have counselors are saying, and we know, and we don't want any more tents anywhere unless they're inside one of these camps, number one. Number two, we've got business leaders coming in front of council saying, uh, capital will flee. It's portable. Yeah, of course it's portable. So if you can't make a living here, you'll go somewhere else. Fair enough. I don't want that to happen. Me neither. We have a group who's, who, who we have helped, uh, we, and we don't even know the half of it in terms of HUPEG, in terms of what we gave in this deal, um, who is spinning this as the renaissance is coming. You put all that together, and what do you think happens to, to the homelessness, homeless people, uh, people uh, suffering from homelessness? Um, uh, they get moved. I do want to make one observation, though, and that is we spend almost a quarter of a billion dollars a year on the Hamilton Police Service. In the, the, a term of council, we will, under current expenditures, spend $1 billion on police in one four-year term of council. We have two officers on the beat in downtown Hamilton. Two. A quarter of a billion dollars, and somehow this is a surprise to Frank Bergen. So whether or not you believe that having more police downtown would help or hurt or do anything. The fact is they're not, they're not even pretending. We've got businesses who are crying for money. So I know what Frank Bergen's gonna do. He said, well, I'll need $270 million. That's how I'll, I'll fix it. Instead of reassessing resources and also really looking at the facts, will it make any difference? So there's a narrative forming, Nora, uh, Laura, with different components. And I'm very worried about the, the message it's starting to create and the people who are going to suffer the most who are the people who are already suffering the most it's going to get worse for them because of decisions we're going to allow at council so here's my hope i'll try to leave this on a hopeful note uh people who follow the o show and follow my social media know that i always post photos or my reflections after spending some time downtown on the weekends um, trying to help out in a small capacity with people who are experiencing hum hunger and homelessness, right? Uh, some people are living, but living precar in precarious housing and can't afford food. Some people don't have either. It, it can be extremely dire. Uh, so I like to try to put a positive note on this. That narrative that is building can be changed. It can be changed. 
Uh, we can see the leaders, whether they're the business community or the partners in the HUPEC project for the entertainment district, whether they're leading restaurateurs in the downtown core, uh, other anchor clients, certainly I've had over the years. I know a lot of the business leaders who have buildings downtown. There is an opportunity to stop the culture war, to stop making it an us or them, and to say, you know what, this is a big problem. We're a big city and we've conquered big problems together in the past. We have created a real Team Hamilton, not just that Andrea Horvath says she's on Team Hamilton because she's running across an intersection in a photo op. We can do a real Team Hamilton approach with leaders in this community to say, what is the most practical and the most effective and the most compassionate way to have a downtown renaissance, to enjoy all of these opportunities for our well-located city with a huge immigration and a huge population demographic shift coming. Uh, how do we leverage all of the opportunity to have a successful city for everyone without further harming and demonizing and, and enfeebling the most vulnerable? How can we speak supportively and strategically and collectively to help the 2,000 people living on our streets and the 10,000 waiting for homes, for affordable housing? How can we help them using all the best of ourselves, the best angels of our nature, the best assets, the best capital we have available? How about those groups, that group, go and pressure forward, right? Uh, if our mayor is unwilling or unable to do it. How about we use all of the power we have in our community, which there is a lot of it, both financially and politically, to say we have a Made in Hamilton solution to have a robust entertainment district, to have a downtown renaissance, and to also help people out of homelessness. It can be done. It's being done elsewhere. They are transitioning people out of homelessness. The Prince of Wales said that homelessness in the UK will be rare and non-repeating within five years. There are people who are working on this, taking leadership. So it doesn't have to be counting on, as you said, a fake mayor who's not going to change and a council that is becoming divided along this kind of cultural dark line, which is, which is very, very scary for the people who are just begging for hope and opportunity. So I just putting a call out there and I've had this conversation with several leaders who have come to my home in the, over the course of the summer. Uh, it's time for us all to step up and work together. This cannot be a business against homeless advocates or half of council against the other half of council or ward six against the downtown wards. All of that nonsense that is politically expedient and easy is going to hurt not only the people who need our help, our neighbors, but it is going to hurt the businesses of Hamilton. It's gonna hurt our tax base. It's going to hurt all those condos that have been built that are shiny with shiny price tags that have people sleeping outside of them, injecting drugs. I mean, we need to work together, Hamilton, to solve this, to pressure Doug Ford in Queens Park, to pressure Justin Trudeau and the federal government Let's not rely on the mayor and council. We can't. They're not showing us the kind of leadership or seriousness that we need. And let's make sure that everybody can succeed. Thank you, Laura. That's very, very well said. I'm going to, uh, because yes, it was a bit a bit dark when we were, I was talking before about this narrative that I really am quite serious about. Yeah. But I, I'm here today because I knew we were going to be talking about some of these challenging topics. And I'm, I've cut my... <laughs> My Probably. Zen candle lit. <laughs> the whole thing. I got my candles, although someone said this looks like an occult symbol over here. But these are my Zen candles. <laughs> um, yeah. Anyway, uh, no laughing matter. Very well said. And uh, thank you so much for, for letting well, me talk. Thank you for watching The O Show. And please uh, make sure to subscribe and like wherever you get your great videos and podcasts. And we will make sure that uh, we keep the content coming. When you care about current affairs, it's on the old show. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on the old show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself into the old show. It's the old show. Laura Babcock's the old show. With a lot of great guests, she puts them to the test on the old show. There's no doubt they'll be calling them out on the old show.
Stand for something, or fall for it all. Ontario, hear the call of the O Show. It's a podcast, the O Show. Laura Babcock's the O Show. Stay informed with the O Show, O Show. Your merch, your merch <laughs>